morning. Morning. Did you sleep well? Yes. All right. At least one of us did. All right. Um, So we are going to um, talk about pneumatology. It sounds like a disease, but uh, it's not. Actually, it's a study of the spirit. Um, And, um, you know, yeah, so let's, let's uh, this is a portion, the Bible verse is from Ezekiel 37, 10. And uh, God told Ezekiel to uh, prophesy over the dry bones in his vision. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they, be, uh, they came to life and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. And this is, you know, of course, it just goes on. Um, we're talking about, I'm not going to talk about this passage, but I'm talking about the spirit today. Um, before I begin, you know, uh, about, is there anybody who was born before 1980s in this room? <laughs> Only Pastor Young and my wife, okay. <laughs> and... Of course, 1980s, right? Some of you. Who were born in 1980s, in the decade of 1980s? Few of you. Uh, you guys mostly in 1990s? All right. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Um, you know, one of the things I noticed uh, about this generation in 1980s and 90s, my son, uh, my two, I have two sons, one was uh, born in 1988 and one in 1990. Um, and they're, they're quite different, you know, as a, as a parent, uh, you know, watching them grow and all that, and the way they approach life it's quite different than my generation. I, I'm called a baby boomer generation. I'm a couple of uh, generations ahead of you. Baby boomer and gen- uh, generation X and uh, millennials, some of you, and after that, Zen Z and so forth. And because um, we approach life differently. Um, you know, um, what's going on? There's some kind of a... All right. So, um, what I notice about my son's generation and the uh, younger generation is usually they're very careful in life. And I don't remember being that careful when I was their age. And the scripture talks about timidity is not from the Lord, but boldness, love, and self-control, which is kind of reversed. So, the timidity implies lack of boldness, sometimes lack of love, a passion, sometimes lack of self-control. I remember uh, Martin Luther, you know, um, the reformer, not Martin Luther King Jr., uh, Martin Luther, and as you know, he's a Catholic, right? So um, he would go to his priest and confess every little thing and driving this priest nuts The priest got so fed up and he shouted at Martin Luther and said, Martin, go sin boldly and then come and repent. Right? And and I'm not telling you to go sin boldly. Some of you are doing very well in that department. So um, I I don't have to encourage you in that. But, But the thing is, people are so petty and they think God is that petty. That's the problem. And Holy Spirit came, God sent His Holy, He breathed upon us so that we may live boldly. Amen? Amen. Boldly. What does that mean? That's a life abundant. What does that mean? That's a living life to the fullest extent. And a full of joy, full of strength, and full of excitement. But what enemy wants to do is hem you in with a sense of great sense of shame and fear of failure. And because of this, even young people are very, very careful not to mess up. You know, it is a privilege of young people to make mistakes. 
right? If you don't mistake, make mistakes now, when are you going to make mistakes? When you're in the 40s, when you have family and kids, when you make mistakes then, it's not only you, the whole other people connected to you. They fall and they feel the pain with you. This is a time to, to be bold, right? And, and, and be able to dream big and then follow what God is saying. Now, I'm not talking about uh, being led by the Holy Spirit tonight, but, you know, we make mistakes in following the Lord. And sometimes we think it's God saying that, but actually got nothing to do with God. Sometimes it's a hidden agenda or, or you know, fear um, and all that. So we're going to talk about that. But this is a great time to learn how to walk with God. So let me start with you this. God is spirit. Amen? God is spirit and we are also spiritual beings. In spiritual being, there's God, the angels, and demons, the fallen angels. And the fourth in, in that spiritual being is us. There's a uniquely in all creation that we have the spirit. None else in creation. And so, here, of course, angels and demons are created being too. But what we're saying is... We are the only ones have a physical body and the spirit. And in fact, we are the only ones in all spiritual realm that we can procreate another spiritual being. Think about that. This is why some theologians say the demons are attacking human sexu uh, sexual sexuality more than any other areas. Because they're so jealous of who we are. Because, you know, we are the only ones who can create another human being, procreate another human being that comes with the spirit. But in the spiritual realm, we are most handicapped because we have this body. And this body will not last forever. But this body is not only our strength or at the same time is a liability. And so, um, we have a very much limitation in understanding God and the Spirit. Because we are so materialistic. We are, we are living in this three-dimensional and fourth dimension, if you, uh, you know, count the time. Uh, in, this, in this realm, and the, what we see, hear, and feel, and touch, and all this, we think this is it. Many times we forget that we are spiritual beings. Right? And so somebody said this, it's not like you are having spiritual experience for a moment. That's a wrong expression. As a human being, we are having temporal human experience. Because our, our spirituality goes into eternity. And our, our physical life will be very limited. 70, 80, 90, maybe in your days, 100 years, and that's about it. We're going to eternity. And therefore we are a finally a spiritual being that God has created. And this is why God is a spirit and his worshipers, us, must worship him in spirit and in truth. We are, along with angels, only capable beings in the entire universe who can worship God in spirit and truth. Now, the thing is this. We are so physically uh, wired up, so we have very difficult time entering into spiritual realm. And many of us misunderstand being spiritual is being emotional. It's got nothing to do with it. In fact, if you don't have a spiritual experience, you think being emotional is spiritual. But when you have a spiritual experience, you, you begin to tell, oh wow, that was just emotional. And this is indeed spiritual experience that I'm having. That you, can, you can discern the two. But many times, a lot of people in the church have never entered into the realm of the spirit. It's all about, you know, cognitive understanding. And, and, and just emotional experience. That's about it. So, um, we are going to just talk about today... So what is spiritual, being in the, in the Spirit, and mainly talk about Holy Spirit. 
and how pervasive his presence is from the scripture. It is all you know. I'm just, I'm just putting it all together because not many believers think about the, the presence of the Holy Spirit throughout the scripture. It's actually beginning to the end. Right? And because of that, they have such a limited understanding of who the Spirit is. That's why they don't appreciate, they don't, they don't really seek after Him. And I told you, some, some pastors even, I'm open to the Holy Spirit. What kind of, you know, thing is that? So, you know, I said to, you know, him, are you stupid? And then my son heard it and said, Pastor shouldn't talk like that. <laughs> the Pharisees, I tell you. So, uh, so, anyways, so I just thought, you stupid. I said, you're not smart, are you? You know, <laughs> that kind of thing. So, um, anyways, ministry of the Holy Spirit. Like first, ministry of the uh, Holy Spirit was active in creation, right? Is a spirit hovered over darkness. And we know that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they're all joined together at the creative work. Right? And then, Holy Spirit came unto many Old Testament characters. Right? Samson, Gideon, you know, like, even those guys who made the uh, uh, tabernacle utensils and the furnishing uh, in the desert, the Holy Spirit came upon them. And, and the thing about Old Testament is, Holy Spirit came and, and did a task through the human being, and then they left. That's what I call vegetation of the Holy Spirit. So for New Testament believers, vegetation of the Holy Spirit is actually wrong terminology. Because He came to stay. Right? To us. Now, and third is Holy Spirit inspired the writers of the Bible. And we know that, right? Uh, the whole Bible is inspired by him. Apostles taught that Jesus was conceived of the Holy Spirit. Think about this very carefully. The second person in Trinity, when he was incarnating, that was a work of the Holy Spirit. And it's incredible the Holy Spirit conceived Mary, Virgin Mary, and this spirit and material coming together, and Jesus, who pre-existed and incarnated in a human being in, 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 our, in our dimension, He came. Right? And that's the work of the Holy Spirit as well. And the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus on His baptism, we know that. You know, dove and all. And the Holy Spirit sustained Jesus' ministry. And it's called Spirit of Jesus. And there are many, many passages in the scripture talks about it. And the resurrection of Jesus. He was there. And uh, who was declared the Son of God with the power of the resurrection from the dead. According to the Spirit of Holiness. That's another name for Holy Spirit. And, and Jesus Christ our Lord. And then... Holy Spirit dwells in a believer and the regeneration of his or her soul for sanctification. In other words, you cannot become Christ-like without His Spirit. And it's Holy Spirit. I told you before, regenerative work, being sanctified, being transformed, is all work of the Holy Spirit. It's not your, your commitment. And it's not your discipline lifestyle. Those things are good. But those things are not the main engine. It is, it is the Spirit of God who, who desires and who empowers uh, uh, the uh, regeneration. And Holy Spirit came upon the disciples of Jesus on the Pentecost and that gave birth to church. In other words, the beginning of the church is the work of the Holy Spirit, once again. And as, G, uh, as the Holy Spirit conceived Mary, it gave birth to incarnated Jesus. Holy Spirit gave birth to the uh, church, the body of Christ, on the Pentecost. This is how pervasive His works are. And, and, uh, uh, and He said, Okay. Um, the Holy Spirit baptized believers and fills them with the power for ministry. And, and it says, God sealed us with His Spirit, a down payment for the future reality. Right? And, and the, where is that? It's uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 1. Now it is God who makes both, both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us and set His seal of ownership on us. 
and put His Spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. So Holy Spirit, in Holy Spirit alone, we can experience the taste of future, what it's going to be like. Without Him, we don't understand. And because of that, our hope is in vacuum. And that cannot be sustained. Now, so, the pervasive of the Holy Spirit uh, uh, ministry, uh, and, uh, you know, Psalmist said this, 139, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depth, you are there. You know, he, he talks about that in the psalm. And he says this, In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with the groans and words cannot be expressed. Words cannot express. Now, you know, a lot of people think, especially in the charismatic uh, circle, think gift of tongue is like some kind of metal. You know, you, you've been faithful and you are like, you know, um, you're serious in faith and because of that God gives you stuff, you know, merit and all that. Is that true? It is not. Right? It is not. In fact, in, in Romans passage here, God gives us tongue because of our weakness. We don't even know what to pray for. This is, isn't that incredible? And because of that spirit groans within us. And that's why, why he gives us tongue, especially prayer tongue. It's not talking about prophetic tongue, which needs to be interpreted. They're talking about prayer tongue that, you know, everybody can pray in tongue. And so it is, it is the Holy Spirit that helps us to pray. We don't even know what we must pray. You know, um, I have a friend in Tajikistan. He's been there like, I don't know, 35, 40 years. And Tajikistan is right above uh, Afghanistan. It's been civil war all that time, right? And um, he has some disciples and, um, uh, uh, you know, this uh, Tajik, uh, they, they married and uh, he's a newlywed. But because of ministry, they had to be separated and the uh, husband was somewhere else and wife was somewhere else. And um, uh, just to give you a kind of context, uh, this, this church was bombed by Taliban from Pakistan before 9-11. And... Um, you know, we had to go there and, uh, you know, help with the uh, uh, medical and all that kind of stuff. But uh, uh, this church was targeted so often by Taliban and, and the Pakistani and the Afghani uh, Taliban's come because this church alone had uh, witnessed over 150,000 Muslims and they converted. And this is one of the most, maybe the most uh, effective ministry uh, out in the, um, that area. Uh, so, um, his, uh, this, this newlywed um, uh, Christian workers, and they had to be separated and they're doing something else. And husband was woken up in the middle of the night and he woke up speaking tongues and uh, praying. He didn't know what he was doing, but he just kept on praying because he knew God was causing him to do something. And he was just praying and praying and praying. And then uh, in about, uh, about 30, 40 minutes later, you know, he felt like released. So he went back to sleep. And he didn't have no idea. You know, this is like before cell phone and all that kind of stuff. Meanwhile, his wife was on the other part of, of Tajikistan. Uh, no, I'm sorry. She was in Afghanistan and doing some ministry. And she was... She was uh, caught by this Taliban, and they brought her out, brought her out, and ha had her kneel down. And this guy had this big boulder in his hands, and he was about to crush his head, uh, her head. And um, Taliban usually they, they don't do this, but something got into him and said, "Hey, you have any last word before I kill you?" And um, she is another, you know. A very uh, passionate believer, and she began to witness to to him, you know, speaking gospel to him, 
And this guy is about to crush her head and with this rock in his, in his hand and he held it this high and he's waiting and he, he thought she would just say one thing and, or, or don't say anything and then he, she would just kill. But she started preaching gospel to him. Now his arm is getting tired and, and, you know, and it started to rain on top of that. <laughs> and he's, he just dropped the rock he just went away. And, and and that's the time when 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 her husband uh, Ajem was praying in tongue. Later on, they found that it was the same time. Uh, and this kind of spiritual realm. Think about it. Ajem, uh, the husband, didn't even know what he was praying for. But God woke him up in his sleep and caused him to pray the content of prayer he doesn't even know. And that saved his wife. And why doesn't God just save her? Why did he, did he have to wake the husband, who doesn't even know what he was praying, to have him pray and to be part of this equation? It doesn't even make sense. But there's a spiritual realm that we are talking about. So you see, there are a whole bunch of things we are missing out because we are not in spiritual realm. And you hear this in the mission field and say, oh yeah, that makes sense. Do you think that doesn't work here? That is a problem. We, believers in the West, somehow think we are in a different realm altogether. And so we can understand, we can take notes and all that, and then as long as we understand, it works. If we don't understand, it doesn't work. This is foolishness. There are tons of things that, that's happening in the world that we have absolutely no idea how to even how to categorize it with our minds. But that's true. The spiritual realm, it happens like that. So, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with the groans that the words cannot express. The thing is, we are fearful of letting go of our control. This is where, where fear of failure comes in. The parents are overwhelming, overprotective, and cause you not to fall. And, and because of this overwhelming protection, insulation from any kind of hardship and because of that many of us are so very fearful of unknown and fearful of failure life is full of failure you know uh, let me uh, i just got you know uh, my wife and i we oversee uh, the um, cell groups in our church you know so we have like about 90 cell groups in our church so we got about 90 emails every week right so the, they report all that things and one of the things i i saw today i was kind of skimming through i don't read the whole thing it's just too long <laughs> <laughs> so, and one guy was sharing um, he was by mistaken identity uh, there, he was a drive shooting victim now what happened was some guy was shooting uh, and and the ricochet from the bullet hit his elbow but he was he was up and coming golf star he was he was going to turn into pro he was in golf college uh, there's such a thing as a golf college in <laughs> Southern California. So he, he, he was, you know, he's all in. I mean, his parents pay, you know, gazillions of money to pay for him to stay and, and do that. He's a muscle memory. So he doesn't even have to practice every day because he just, everything is automatic for him. And he's just about to turn to pro and then this, this, this thing happened. And then his elbow got shattered. Goodbye. And I have a, you know, a, there's a, there's a, um, no longer a young lady, but there's a lady in MI. Ever since she was a kid, she wanted to be a doctor. She studied hard, went to one of the best high school, went to be best uh, uh, college, and uh, she became, uh, you know, she, she was in medical school, and uh, she was doing fellowship, and she was doing so well. She came to interview in Southern California, and to for fellowship. And the uh, interview you know, we went, went so well, and the interviewer said, why don't you join me in the OR, operation room? 
And, and she just walked in. There was, this wasn't even planned. And she walked in and, uh, hey, uh, hand me that. And she was do doing that. She, The interviewer liked her so much. And say, you know, she was just showing her favor and all that. What happened was, she was holding the syringe like this. And this is very, very deadly uh, uh, medicine. And this, the interviewer turned around and poked herself. And there's an emergency. That split second, all her dreams went down the drain. That was the end of it. And, and, and she had to be treated, you know, uh, emergency and the, the operation. I don't know how they wrap up the operation. This interviewer, interviewee, that's the end of her dream. And, you know, she had to find something else and stuff like that. Let me tell you, life, right, whatever you carefully dream and plan and, and do all this, it can change in a split second, just like that. And I don't know how anyone can live this life to the fullest without the confidence and boldness that comes from God, Holy Spirit, that you are at the center of God's will. It is foolish. I'm not saying try hard or dream, uh, don't dream or anything. Uh, think about it. It can happen in a split second. And all that you dream about and all that. So it's foolish to assume that you are in control of your life. And however carefully you build, you're going to see and eat the fruit of that labor. It's not. Nothing is guaranteed. And that's why it's so important that we walk with God, especially those who have given ourselves to the Lord for eternity. Right? So, sanctification process. And this is what Paul, because Galatians, go home and read Galatians very carefully. This is where Paul becomes sarcastic. You know, and this guy, it, I don't think Paul was a nice person. Uh, he really mean in, in this letter. And he says, are you so foolish? See, he talks like me. Are you stupid? You know, that, that's what it is. And after beginning with the Spirit, are you not trying to attain your goal by human effort? Fleshly, that's what he's saying. And this is a kind of translation um, for thing. You becoming a, a, a child of God is not your effort. It's not your choice alone. It's working with the Holy Spirit in your life, prep you for the gospel message, for you to invite Him and repent before Him. Amen? Amen. It's not your, you're figuring out all these kind of things. None of us are that smart. It's a working of the Holy Spirit, situations you find yourself in, the how you're brought up, and all that God was working in different elements, and millions and myriads of elements that that works to that decision making. And so you 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 become a child of God. And that's a spiritual experience, right? And then the, be filled with the Holy Spirit. These these guys, and if you read the whole thing, they are filled with the Holy Spirit. So you you are you begin with the spirit. Now you're trying to finish it with your fleshly, human effort. Are you kidding me? You cannot even you cannot do this. If you are able to do this in human effort, why do you even need spirit? That's what he's talking about. So this is a Holy Spirit's ministry is absolutely necessary for us to be sanctified. What does it mean that sanctify? It's Christ-likeness. To become like our Lord. Why? Because Holy Spirit is another name for Spirit of Jesus. We cannot become like Jesus without His Spirit. That's basically what it is. The so sanctification process is a process through which we get wind out of light based on the flesh and switch on to spirit-based life. That's what sanctification is. So become more like Christ. Right? Now, but then, I told you before, we are handicapped because we have the flesh and the spirit. Angels only got spirit. Demons only have spirit. Right? And so we are the ones uh, have to live this tension, especially when our flesh, the flesh has fallen. As a residue and vestige of sin still remains with us. Yes, we are forgiven. That doesn't matter. That does not mean we we have become um, sinless. No, right? The the habits of sin, our brain, our pathway 
is set already. So sinning or thinking sinful way is natural for us. It's automatic. Have you seen some people? Some people lies when they don't really need to lie. Right? They're so used to lying. So they don't even catch themselves. You, you ask a simple question and it's just yes or no. You, you know, there's nothing involved here. But he lies. You know. Like, why are you lying? I had a guy uh, who uh, borrowed uh, this softball bat. Uh, I guess, I don't know. But it's very expensive ones. I don't know. But this guy borrowed for a whole season and didn't return it, right? And so this guy went to his dorm and said, Hey, dude, where is my uh, bat? And he, he sees it right there. I said, I don't know. I thought I gave it back to you. And he was saying, Are you sure? What is that? And he said, that's not yours. No, that's not. I see my name on it. Yeah. <laughs> like some people, like their life is so filled with lie. Lying is so natural. And there's no need to lie. But they lie. Self-deception. See, once you lie to yourself, lying to other people is automatic. Let me tell you this. You know Jacob and Esau? Right? Does this church teach Bible? <laughs> Jacob and Esau. Esau sold his birthright to Jacob in a bowl of lentil soup. Right? Hello? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Before he sold his uh, birthright, do you know what he says? Yeah, I'm about to die. What good is a birthright to me? Why did he say that? To whom did he say that? He was convincing himself it's okay to sell his birthright and eat this yaki soup. Because <laughs> he wasn't convincing Jacob, he was convincing himself. He wanted to do what is f uh, flesh, but this irony, this, this uh, com commitment or cultural mandate for birthright, he couldn't just override it. So he had to lie to himself, rationalize with Excuses that's not even right. He was not about to die. But he had to lie to himself. And once he lies to himself, he's free. And we do this all the time. Right? If I, if I just miss this promotion, I'm done for. Right? And because of this, I have to put in extra 10 hours this week. And because of this, I cannot go to church. And whatever else, right? And we, we rationalize in, in ourselves, even though we told ourselves, this, this year, God will be my first priority and all that kind of things. And then when, when push becomes shove, you rationalize. And you lie when you don't need to lie. And because in order to make you sin freely. We do this all the time. And we cannot become like Christ unless we are very honest to ourselves. And the Spirit of God convicts us. You know how Holy Spirit works in our lives many times? is through conscience. Right? The problem with the conscience is conscience is shaped by the culture and custom. And many times the media, whatever value system we put that, we don't, we don't even think about it, think about vetting out those values. But it kind of, uh, um, our, our values and greed, greed of uh, um, uh, understanding is formed without us recognizing it. Without our acknowledgement, it is being formed. So this conscience... Unless you are biblically washed, in other words, you have new worldview, new value system, and that is established by the Word and the Spirit, your conscience is good for nothing. 
because it's going to it's going to say something against you according to the society and its values and a lot of people in church they depend on conscience as as the voice of the holy spirit as i said it could if it's washed and renewed by the biblical you know uh, values and the uh, spirit but many times it is not it is left alone it's still the the product of uh, flesh and if you depend on that to tell you listen to holy spirit you are barking up the wrong tree and therefore a lot of christians so called and they're saying you know i, I heard the holy spirit and, and all that it's not holy spirit they're their own desire and they're just using the biblical word to just cover it and that kind of people pay hefty price because you are misrepresenting god the serious sin before him i had a couple in our church and um, they're saying oh, you know they want to meet me so okay and then we we're sitting down talking and and the uh, and the husband said you know god told me to move our family uh, to like south you know and i was listening to him it's basically he was sick of driving in la traffic uh, and he's spending like hour and 40 minutes one way and the other way and and his wife refused to move from that part of the town uh, going closer to uh, uh, his work and she was stay home mom but she refused to move and so he's the one driving back and forth and and what he's saying is he, he told me that God told him to spend more time with his kids and, and all that and therefore they had to move there and all that after listening to him, I said, I don't think it's Holy Spirit telling you that. He got really offended. And so I, I said, I think you're just sick of driving. And he said, no, and all that. And they left the church, of course. And uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, either way, they're going to go anyway. So you know. the thing is, that a lot of people use Holy Spirit as some kind of blanket uh, reason for whatever they want to do in the flesh I don't think he found a job there still he left a good job and to do that and so a lot of people so called I mean the wife supposed to be like prophetic and she hears from the Lord and all that kind of stuff and uh, I was talking to them I said no that was not from the Lord that was from your flesh, basically. And people have confusion because, you know, they, a lot of people, especially selfish people, rationalize that it is from the Lord when it's not. Can I have water, please? Uh, somewhere? Yeah, just give me a bottle, please. Um, so, how do you walk with the Holy Spirit then? Okay, you got stuck. Oh. Where are you? Okay. All right. So, um, because we have body and the spirit, there is a tension here. And the scripture says very clearly, these body and the spirit are opposite. Right? They are not something that you can rationalize together. So, for the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit. The spirit, what is contrary to the sinful nature, they are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. Galatians 5.17 And then, one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. And one who sows to please the spirit, from the spirit will reap eternal life. Very clear. There is nothing in between. You cannot rationalize your way out here. It's the spirit, our sinful nature, our body is in opposite to one another. It will desire the opposite from one another. That's why a lot of people are under a bondage, under the oppression of the enemy, because we do not understand this opposition, right? Then how do you walk in the Spirit? Um, our responsibility is to stay sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit, spoken through the Word of God, both written and spoken, as well as sanctified conscience. I say sanctified conscience. Because you need to input and, and deliberately reconstruct your, your conscience. 
You cannot just leave it as it is, right? And this is why uh, the uh, study of the scripture and discipleship and all that is very necessary to hold your biblical worldview and value. There's a delicate tangle between the influence of the Holy Spirit and our free will. And God will never override our free will, for it is the greatest gift and greatest responsibility from our, our Father in Heaven. God has given us this free will, and, and it's a gift and a responsibility as a spiritual being who will live eternally with the Lord. And because of this, we need to guard this well. And this strong, this free will to be able to um, um, act or, or it does its job uh, freely, we need to feed into that, right? Spiritually. So, let me just wrap up, up to here. The deep uh, honesty and integrity are key to spiritual growth and development. Let me repeat this again. You need to be honest and have integrity and courage to be spiritual. It's not like jumping up and down and, and speaking, you know, talking like turkeys, you know, and all that. And that's not spiritual things. And some people wave flags and all that and jump up and down and it looks nice and all, but it's not a spiritual thing. That's just hoopla. It, it takes incredible honesty to lay yourself before the Lord. And God is not fooled by this noise. God doesn't look outside. God looks at the heart. Right? That integrity and purity. That's why Paul talks about purity of heart and sincere, uh, sincere faith. And that is to become spiritual, uh, the, the, your spirit to come alive under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And, and when people are not courageous enough to deal with the ugly self, the sinful nature, and we just gloss over with, with the plastic religious word and this and that, and when we deal with that, Holy Spirit doesn't, doesn't stay or honor that person. This is very important, brothers and sisters. There are a lot of people who say this, this religious stuff all the time. You poke him and Bible verse comes out, you know, and, and all that. And, and you think, oh my gosh, this guy is really, really, you know. God is not impressed with that kind of stuff. You know, some people in our church, they, they always, they come out and pray for a uh, congregation church. They always quote the Bible verse. And I, I told that person, I said, who are you trying to impress? God? It's His Word. <laughs> you know? Cut that out. I mean, you just, you know, what are you trying to do? I mean, if you do that, He's obligated. Oh my gosh, she's quoting Bible. I cannot, I have to listen to her. Is, is that what He does? Is it just cut that out. You know? Just be real. Talk to her. Talk to our Heavenly Father. Father, I really messed up. I need help. You know, this thing I didn't want to do, but end up doing it. But even worse than that, I tried to rationalize using religious talk. And, and I feel really awful about that. I don't want to ever do this again. So help me. Stuff like that. That's real. You know, and, and, and some, some people have a kind of weird idea of being a spiritual kind of thing. And it's not. And, 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 and so... With that kind of attitude, we can offend the Spirit of God. So I'm going to talk about, you know, offending the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. You know, we got to welcome and honor Him, at least not offend Him, right? This is not a good direction here. Grieving the Holy Spirit. You can grieve the Holy Spirit. This is, uh, let, let, let me clarify here. We have Holy Spirit in, dwell, in us. Amen? Amen? As a child of God. You might not be filled with the Holy Spirit, but you at least have Holy Spirit resides in us. Right? And, and this Holy Spirit is so gentle, He's not going to override your free will. And he, he, 
by the eliminating ministry of the Holy Spirit, he will uh, cause you to remember Bible verses or something in an appropriate situation. Sometimes he will speak through the conscience if the conscience is renewed by the Bible and its biblical values and the uh, spirit and, and all that. But he talks very gently. It's a very quiet influence. In other words, you can override him very easily with your flesh. And this way, we actually sin against him. And, and, and this grieving the Holy Spirit, Scripture is talking about our stubborn disobedience. Right? And where do we find it? Ephesians chapter 4, 30. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, uh, 30. It says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. It's Greek again. It's a present imperative. You know what that is? It's not do not grieve the Holy Spirit. It's actually stop grieving the Holy Spirit. Because people are grieving the Holy Spirit. And this is what Paul is saying. Stop grieving the Holy Spirit. Why? How? With whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. And then it goes on. And, uh, and uh, the disobedience, uh, stubbornness, and all that kind of things that he's talking about. And the second part of uh, offending the Holy Spirit is quenching the Holy Spirit. Trying to control the fluidity of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Right? And this is what happens. The people who try, they'll have a control issue. And they'll not be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because as long as I have to understand this, I need to control this. I don't, I don't want it to go this way. I only want this way. You are not going to experience the feeling of the Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit will not relegate His control over your control. He's not going to come in that way. He's not going to fill you in that way. Right? So, quenching the Holy Spirit is people trying to control the Spirit. And, you know, Jesus says this. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. The wind blows where it goes, and so is the man of the Spirit. And so you don't know where he comes from and where he's going. And that's the fluidity of the Holy Spirit. And that's why Holy Spirit is very difficult to quantify or qualify in a doctrinal statement. Let me, let me digress a little bit. You know, there are a lot of people, uh, you know, I'm working with a lot of pastors who come from Reformed uh, background, Reformed theological background. I usually call them Deformed theology. <laughs> <laughs> because it's this. This Reformed theology is mainly formed in the 16th, 17th, 18th century. Now they're regurgitating all that. 16th, 17th, 18th century, it is in the middle of Age of Enlightenment and Renaissance. And they have an overwhelming, it's a, what is it, the unwarranted confidence in the formula. This is where Isaac Newton has a, you know, uh, the, the, what is it, the velocity and all that, the formulas and all the basic physics and all that. So they thought they could pin down all the doctrinal statement in, in the words and they accurately um, describe the activity, the activity of God, who God is and all that kind of stuff. And they do a good job. But when it comes to Holy Spirit, you cannot pin that down. Because it's not one-on-one. -on -one. If you do this, Holy Spirit will do it. And there's never like that in the scripture. He, he flows. Where he goes. He's in control. You cannot control, right? So this is, it says, do not quench the Holy Spirit. And, and, and here, 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 through 21, he says, do not put out the Spirit's fire. This quench. Do not quench the fire of the Holy Spirit. That's what he said. And he says, do not treat prophecy with contempt. Test everything, hold on to the good. Now, let me, let me uh, give you an example here. Once again, do not treat prophecies with contempt. Is that present imperative, right? So, what does that mean? Stop treating prophecies with contempt. That assumes ongoing action. The churches are already treating prophecies with contempt. Because some prophecies are way out there. And usually when we do like spiritual things, usually flaky people go first, right? And so the people who are more, quote unquote, you know, sophisticated, they don't like it. And so no more prophecies, because these people are weird. And, and, and so we don't have prophecies. So they try to control what the Holy Spirit is doing. 
by trying to control, you quench the fire of the Holy Spirit. And he says, at the same breath, he says, but test everything. Test everything. Because some of the prophecies are, are their own. Because they are making errors. Right? It's okay. Let me also give you something else here. False prophets. Right? You know, false, pro false prophets. The prophets who make mistakes. Are they false prophets? No. Teachers who make mistakes, are they false teachers? The false prophet and false teachers are the ones who have an uh, ulterior motive to derail you from your faith. They're the false teachers and false prophets. They're different from people who are exercising their gift and, and while doing so, they're learning the discernment and making mistakes and all that. That's not false prophets. Right? False teachers. You understand this, right? And therefore, in this church community, in Thessalonians, uh, Thessalonica and other places, and people are practicing their gift, especially New Testament prof prophetic gift, and, and doing so, they are making mistakes. Right? And that's why some, some of the leaders are saying, no more. We don't do prophecy anymore. Because some, some people are saying, we are stuff. And all that. And the, what, what is Paul saying? Do not, do not do that. Stop quenching the fire of the Holy Spirit. Right? Do not stop treating prophecy with contempt. But test everything. And hold on to what is good. But right, there's a good stuff the Holy Spirit is saying, and there's always, you know, other chaff, right? And just blow that off. But do not quench what Holy Spirit is doing. What is he saying? Paul is saying, hey, be gracious to one another. Nobody is an expert here. We are learning to walk with the Holy Spirit. Some will make mistakes, some will get it right. And because of that, hold on to what is good. And whatever that is not good, just blow it off. That's common sense that Paul is talking about. What does that mean? Be patient with one another. Extend your grace. Do not judge. Do not criticize. But encourage. Right? That's what he's saying. But you can offend the Holy Spirit by trying to control it. And... and, and, and you know, put a stop to it and not respecting what Holy Spirit is doing in another person's life. Finally, there's a blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. Blaspheming against the Holy Spirit, there are a lot of stuff and I'm not going to go into all that. But in a larger context, willfully crediting, crediting the Satan for the work of the Holy Spirit is... Um, Knowing the work is from God. Alright, so this is what happened. In, in Israel, um, you know, there's a prophecy in Isaiah and other places. When, when the Messiah comes, the lame will walk, the blind will see, and, and all that kind of, mute will speak, and all that kind of things. It's actually written in uh, um, a children's lullaby. So the kids, when they go to bed, you know, uh, they, there's a song they sing. So everybody knows. Every little kid up on, everybody knows. This is a sign of the Messiah. That's why when the John the Baptist was arrested, and, and uh, he was in the prison so long, and he was kind of wondering, hey, did I get the right person? Or do I have to get, uh, we are waiting for another uh, Messiah. So he sent his disciples to Jesus and said, are you the one? Or do you have to wait for another one? And what did Jesus say? You go tell him what you see. The lambs walk and blind see and all that. Why? Because everybody knows that's a sign of Messiah. Now, he was healing and, and, and all this and the casting out demons and all that. And the Pharisees knew that these are the very signs of Messiah. But then when people ask, no, no, no that guy cannot be. Because he doesn't keep Sabbath the way we keep. And therefore, he's doing all these things, these false signs, doing all these things by the power of Beelzebub, the lord of the flies, Satan. Right? And he's doing it in the power of Satan. And they know full well that's the sign of the Messiah, what God is doing. 
So when they said that, and Jesus turned around and said, you can say whatever you want against the Son of Man, but if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, there's no forgiveness. And so this is a very difficult thing to do because you know full well the work of the Holy Spirit and you are making that into sin and, and, and the work of Satan. There are some in Christian, uh, Christian circle, they go very close to this kind of sin. They know it is from the Lord. And the Bible says very clearly. And because they don't fit into the paradigm of their theology, they learn and they attack another uh, body, uh, another member of the body, and say, well, that's not from the Lord. Have to be very careful on this, right? So, um, at least we shouldn't go into this, this area, right? So here, uh, Jesus says, and everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. He says. Now, so I, I, I told you this before. So I'm going to uh, speak about it a little bit here. Indwelling Holy Spirit and baptism of the Holy Spirit and filling of the Holy Spirit. Now, um, And here in John 14, 16, it says, And I'll ask the Father, and He'll give you another counselor to be with you forever. And just before He says, It is good for you that I go away. It is good for you that Jesus goes away. So that He can send His counselor for you. In other words, Holy Spirit coming into our lives and filling our lives is more beneficial for us as a children of God and follower of Christ, than Christ being on earth somewhere. Because it's readily available for us and it's very personal to us. And, um, and, and, and Paul talks about it, uh, this, and did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And uh, you know, this is the same question I'm, I'm talking about. The filling of the Holy Spirit, therefore, is a core experience of every believer. And you need to know that you must be filled with the Holy Spirit. Some of the things that uh, prevent you from being filled with the Holy Spirit is once again, the mind that had to control and have to know our fear. Some people even, uh, some churches even taught them when you ask for Holy Spirit and uh, all that and, and the tone we see, you know, I was actually praying for some pastor and uh, I, I went there and uh, tried to you know, lay hands and pray. And this guy was praying louder than me. All that kind of stuff. And so I said, I told him, shut up, man. I'm trying to pray for you. Uh, and I said, why are you praying so loud? So I, I, I told him uh, later on, and what, what's going on? And he said, he grew up in a, in a tradition that when somebody lays hands and pray for you, you can be actually demonized. So he was praying for himself to make sure that he's properly protected. I was really offended by that. <laughs> and I was thinking, I was thinking oh, let, let, so let me ask you this. You believe in Heavenly Father who loves you more than you can ever love yourself. You believe in Heavenly Father who is more powerful than any other being on the face of the earth or anywhere in the universe. And you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And another, another believer is laying hands and praying that you will be filled with the Holy Spirit. And this Heavenly Father will sit and look the other way when Satan creeps in and goes into you and mess your life. You believe that. I said, your theology about Heavenly Father is messed up. Now what kind of what kind of tradition uh, are you from? And this is another guy from deformed tradition. <laughs> so let me tell you this. You know we have, we believe in stuff that is so contrary to the scripture, and we are more suspicious of God and His ulterior motives than that of Satan. Who lied to us like this? Satan. And under the name of biblical studies and theology, we have just messed people up. We mess them about their understanding of heart of Heavenly Father. 
that's a sin against Him. Right? But we do this all the time. And, and so, that's why it is, it is very important and the core experience that we must be filled with the Holy Spirit. Without willful submission to the power and the influence of the Holy Spirit, one cannot have a breakthrough in his her bondage, habitual sins, character formation, including inner healing issues such as pride and fear, and etc. And the manifestation of gifts. You cannot break through. Once again, let me tell you this. If you could try it harder and did it yourself, why would you need Holy Spirit? But why are you telling yourself, if I just try harder, it will be done? That's a lie. Right? I mean, if you, if you can become good, good enough to be saved by yourself, why did you just die in the first place? It just cannot be done. It's in the Spirit. And this is why Jesus talked to Nicodemus, the teacher of the Jews, and said, I'm talking about things of the earth and you don't even understand. How can you understand things of the Spirit? But you cannot. And in, the, in Isaiah 55, it talks about my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your, way, uh, your thoughts. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts than yours. Right? There's a, we have total incap incapable, we are totally incapable of understanding things of the Spirit. That's why Jesus came in the body and explain what it means to be spiritual, what it means to walk as a, as a child of God. He showed us. And then He left His Spirit, Holy Spirit, so that He can teach us and continually walk with us. And therefore, we become the men of the Spirit, the women of the Spirit. That's what He wants. From the very beginning, He wanted to animate us. You know, uh, let me go back to uh, creation story. When, in the creation story, uh, when God made Adam, and He breathed in His nostril, right? And as you know, uh, that's His breath, the wind, and the Spirit. And then the Bible says, He became a living being. It doesn't mean He became a biological being. Do you know that? It means he became a soulish being. And soulish, especially in the area of soul that desires a relationship. So I, thou, relationship. So when, when the Spirit of God was uh, imputed in, in, in uh, Adam as a biological being, and he became a soulish being who desires a uh, I, you, relationship with God. That's what it means. And that relationship, and that is animated by and, and uh, empowered by the Spirit of God. So without the Spirit, we don't desire God. You know what sin is? Sin is not killing and stealing and, and, and doing bad stuff. That's a sinful behavior. Sin is living life as though God doesn't exist. God's will matters. You are independent and separated from God. That's sin. And because of sin, you do sinful behavior. And this sin, you're not sever your relationship with God. You are independent from God and you are complete without God. That's sin. But when, when God has breath, uh, breathe on Adam, and when Adam received the breath of God, Spirit of God, he began to desire his relationship with God. Right? And this is why he wants the Holy Spirit. He wants us to become the temple of the Holy Spirit. Not only individually, but as a corporate group. The Holy Spirit dwells among us. Not only in us, but among us. That's, that's a powerful stuff. That's what church ought to be. Right? And that's what he desires. But this requires that you have willingness, deliberate willingness to submit yourself to the influence 
and the presence of the Holy Spirit, which could be quite different from your imagination or upbringing. So if you say, God, you got to be like this, all right? Then I'll accept you. How ridiculous is that? And God will do whatever He wants. We're going to submit ourselves to Him. And He will have it His way. I surrender all. Isn't that what it is? I surrender all. Right? So that's how the Holy Spirit comes and fills and enlivens a church. So filling is, as I mentioned yes, last night, is overflowing. So if you have a cup and the fill with the Holy Spirit doesn't mean halfway, does it means to the brim and overflowing. Play role means that it's overflowing. So when, when somebody is filled with the Holy Spirit, what does that mean? It means you are under the overwhelming influence of the Holy Spirit. Right. Is there any married person in this group? Okay. Few of you. There's three of you. Okay. Alright. All right. So, alright. So let's say you just got married. When, when did you get married? A year and a half ago. A year and a half ago. Okay. Alright. How about you? Oh, you're old. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's say you just got married. You're in honeymoon, all right? All right. You're happy. You are filled with happiness, right? And then uh, you, you know you rent a car, you park wrong, and you got a parking ticket. Your overwhelming happiness about being married should override your concern for a parking ticket. But if you go, oh my gosh, I got parking ticket, I cannot believe this, you know, and then you ruin the whole honeymoon, then you are stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what I'm telling you. The pervasive mood and sensitivity of your life is so attuned to the Holy Spirit. That's filled with the Holy Spirit. Your primary concern, your feeling and emotion and response are all driven by this, this gratitude and overwhelming love for the Lord by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's being filled with the Holy Spirit. And with that, you can forgive people. With that, you can be patient with some people. With that, you can go out of your way to sacrifice your material goods, your time, your listening ear. And you can be little Christ. Christ-likeness happens. That's being filled with the Holy Spirit. That's side effects of being filled with the Holy Spirit. And sometimes it... it, it uh, accompanies physical manifestation or speaking tongue or whatever right and some gifts and uh, some miraculous things happen but those things come and go they do not they do not define the feeling of the Holy Spirit feeling of the Holy Spirit is you're overwhelmingly mindful of the Spirit and therefore what happens in the physical realm has a secondary uh, in, uh, effect in you. That's being filled with the Holy Spirit. But if you must remain in control of the situation and must understand everything that's going on, you'll never be able to come under the mighty empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. That's the thing. But, let me go back to a story. If you have a fear of failure, then you need to control, you need to understand, you need to make sure that you never, you know, um, make a mistake, misstep. Then you are that much hemmed in from the influence of the Holy Spirit. Who put that fear in your life? Who put that timidity in your life? Who put that uncertainty in your life? 
that robs you from fullness of life. That's enemy's work. Sometimes it's well intended, you know, overprotecting a helicopter parenting. But the impact effect of it is enemy can use that to forever hem you from entering into the presence of God in fullness. And I pray, since we are all young, I pray you make a lot of mistakes this year. I hope you sin boldly. And not sin, but you know, try good things boldly, right? <laughs> and if you mess up, repent, be embraced by the incredible mercy of our God. Some of you really don't understand how deep and wide His forgiveness is. How comforting and loving His embrace is. Because you are so right all your life. You are so careful not to make any mistakes. You follow that line so carefully. Not knowing that one quick turn can poke your interviewer with a deadly medicine. And you're building so carefully on your own, thinking that you're in control. You are not. And that's a lie. Doesn't mean you'll become reckless. No. Of course. You want to hear the voice of the Lord. We're going to talk about that tonight. Being led by the Holy Spirit is the most exhilarating experience in your life. Once you do it, second time you do it, every time it scares the heck out of you. But every time you do it, you get such a ride out of life. You didn't know life can be this exciting, this joyful, this powerful. It's not stale religion. Just come and do the same thing and then go home. Same thing. How many, how many of you, this is your first retreat ever. Can I see your hand? First retreat in your life. Well, good for you. But most of you, this must be like thousands of retreat. <laughs> right? You grew up in a church, it's like hundreds of retreat, right? You know how it goes. After this, you go home, within two weeks, everything goes. <laughs> Am I not right? Well, we go, and then next time we come back and we pump ourselves up and, yeah, and then back of your mind, it's going to be the same thing when I go back, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Why do you go through stuff like that? And that's not going to help you at all. What I'm trying to say to you is walking with the Spirit of God is such a scary but wonderful experience. You know, this is this is what what Bible says about Mary when he is coming when she was coming back from the tomb of Jesus, empty tomb. And scripture says, and she was filled with the fear and wonder. That's appropriate emotion, mix of emotion for Christian life, now, walking with God. That's an incredible exhilaration. At the same time, it's a lot of fear because you never went there before. And God is God is extend, expanding us and, and and leading us, inviting us into into a path that you have never gone before. And that's that's what God has planned for you. And when when somebody says God has an incredible plan for you, doesn't mean you're gonna you go to best college, you're gonna get a best job, and everything is smooth. You're gonna marry a nice person, have, you know, all that, and house in I don't know Long Island or whatever else, and, and you're gonna retire by 35, and you're gonna get a big RV and drive up and down Florida and, and die afterwards. You know that that's not what we're talking about. Right? So we are talking about living your life to the fullest that you never dreamt of in the places and doing things. And God led you there. And uh, it's incredible. And I pray that you have that blessing. All right? So must welcome Holy Spirit. We understand He's a person. Right? Finally is this. I want to finish with this. 
unpredictability of the Holy Spirit. This is the most exciting thing about Holy Spirit. You know, Holy Sp uh, uh, Peter was invited to uh, speak at a, a Cornelius house. It's the first Gentile gathering. Just Gentiles. No, no, you know, Hebrew Jews or, or, or uh, Greco Roman Jews. It's just, just Gentile. And he went there and he's preaching. While he was preaching, it's usually it's like this. We got to preach and people repent and then we pray over them and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit couldn't wait anymore. Maybe Peter spoke too long. <laughs> and and the, while he's speaking, Holy Spirit just came upon them. I just messed up Peter's presentation. He didn't even get the punchline, right? <laughs> and, and boom! Holy Spirit is done, right? And so this is what happened. While Peter was still speaking these words, Holy Spirit came upon all of them who heard the message. And this is the most exciting thing about Holy Spirit. He does his thing when people welcome him. When people honor him as God, you know, as you see, pervasive work of the Holy Spirit from beginning to the end. And the scripture says, when the one who holds back in the latter days, in eschatology, in the end time, when the whole one who holds back the evil one, when he's taken out of the way, that's Holy Spirit. Literally, hell breaks loose upon the earth. And his work. And from beginning to the end. So, this morning, I just would like to invite you. You know, you know about this. I'm just reviewing, you know, and putting all together. Let's live to the fullest. That's Father's desire for each and every one of you. When God created you in His mind, He wants you to live to the fullest according to His plan. Not according to the plan of your parents or your professors, your, your bosses at work. But His plan is for you to live to the fullest. And this life as a believer, you know, I want you to know you cannot fail. Right? As a believer, you cannot fail. As a, as a person who is animated by the Holy Spirit, you cannot fail. Your failure will even turn into your victory. That's why you are more than conquerors. And because with this confidence, we're going to live boldly. Amen? Amen. And you, because you step out of your comfort zone and break through the fear of failure. And some people are you know, paralyzed by this fear. Some people are under bondage by the shame of failure or past. And all these things are trappings of Satan. So that you may not become what God has planned. And so you got to reject those things and rebuke it in the name of Jesus. And let past be past. And you're going front or forward by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? And that God's perfect will be done in your life by the power of the Holy Spirit. As you humbly walk with Him. As you trust Him. How do you honor Him? Trust Him. And then, as, as I said before, as you make that step, at first, you know, like babies who learn to walk, you cannot stumble and flatly fall on your face. That's given. That's part. You got to roll that into your calculation. Right? Nothing in life, you, no babies like walk like ballerina, right? You know, from the beginning, hey, you have to just, you know, uh, fly on your face. That is given part of the equation. Don't get discouraged by it. Right? And say you say and after that you, you get off and say, Lord, next time better. I want to do better. And then let the Lord let the Lord give you strength and encouragement and the power. And then and soon before you realize it, you're in a place. The Bible has this word suddenly. Suddenly the Lord is at the temple. But suddenly what you've been wanting and desiring for your life, you're standing in the middle of it. And that's, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Why don't we, um, what do you do here? Stand or, I know Pastor Young, uh, stand and hold hands and stuff. Don't hold hands, all right. Just stand. Uh, uh. Why don't we take a moment 
Let me take a moment and pray sincerely to the Lord. Lord, I don't know whatever he said, Pastor Keith said. I want some of that. I want to live to the fullest. I, I, I don't want to miss out anything that you have planned for me. And I want Holy Spirit to come and rule over my soul. The band, you guys know the song, Rule Over My Soul?